Life in a city under the control of a criminal organization is far from easy. Unfortunately, crime is a widespread phenomenon in certain regions of Latin America. The police struggle with crime prevention and investigation, while the prosecution and judiciary also fail to fulfill their duties adequately. These conditions create perfect circumstances for the growth of criminal activities, as was the case in Quito, the capital of Ecuador, in 1991 and 1992. Juan Fernando Hermosa was born on February 28, 1976, in Ecuador. His early years were spent in a shelter in the city of Babahoyo, located in the province of Los Rios. Later, Juan was adopted by a couple residing in the heart of Quito, the capital of Ecuador. His adoptive parents were Rafael Olivo and Amanda Suarez. Little is known about Juan's early life. It is only certain that at the age of 15, he became the leader of a gang of like-minded individuals involved in robberies. The group would spend their free time at gaming arcades in downtown Quito. At 15, Juan was of average height, with a slim build. He had expressive facial features and curly hair. His eyes were protruding, harboring an enigmatic gaze. Juan possessed skillful communication and easily manipulated people of different ages. Despite his young age, he and his friends frequented bars and nightclubs in the area known as Points del Guambra, far from the Central University of Ecuador. On the morning of November 22, 1991, Juan and his friends left a nightclub and decided to take a taxi. They got into a Chevrolet Sanremo and traveled to Diagosto Avenue. Before settling the fare with the driver and exiting the vehicle, Juan unexpectedly pulled out a gun and shot the driver in the head. The man died instantly. Subsequently, one of the boys accompanying Juan drove the taxi with the driver's body to the southeast of the city, to the Valle de los Chilos Valley. This murder marked the beginning of Juan's criminal record. A week later, Juan and his friends attended a party where they heavily consumed alcohol. Afterward, they went to the house of an acquaintance named Charlie, who had invited them over. However, a dispute broke out between Juan and Charlie, culminating in five gunshots and Charlie's death. During the following months, Juan's gang continued their criminal activities. Their main targets were taxi drivers and young people with non-traditional sexual orientations. The gang's victims were shot with a 9mm pistol. The crimes predominantly took place on weekends, primarily in downtown Quito. Society was gripped with horror and panic. By that time, Juan and his gang had committed over 20 cold-blooded and ruthless murders. All these killings occurred within a short period, with robbery as their main motive. Juan became Ecuador's youngest serial killer. The police and media dubbed him El Niño del Terror, or the Child of Terror. Eventually, the police put an end to Juan's criminal career. Major Fausto Terran, the head of Ecuadorian intelligence, formed a special task force to investigate the murders committed by Juan's gang. As part of the investigation led by Major Bastillos, several young criminals, who were members of Juan's gang and attempted to commit a robbery in downtown Quito, were apprehended. This significant arrest provided crucial information about the whereabouts of the gang's leader. During interrogation, one of the captured criminals named Tomas Anglo revealed Juan's location. It turned out that Juan was hiding in one of the houses belonging to his adoptive family. On January 16, 1992, at 3 a.m., police stormed the house where Juan was hiding. The police intended to catch him sleeping in his room. However, Juan was actually sleeping in his adoptive mother's room. When the police entered the house, he woke up and started firing his gun uncontrollably. The police also used firearms. In a state of complete frenzy, Juan used a grenade, which surprisingly was in his possession. The grenade fell among a group of police officers standing at the entrance of the house. As a result, the explosion demolished one of the walls, and debris fell on the police officers. During the intense shootout that spiraled out of control, Juan's adoptive mother was injured. She sustained 11 gunshot wounds and died on the spot. Juan, who was eventually apprehended, did not suffer any injuries. He was arrested while attempting to escape through a window at the back of the house. The sounds of gunshots and the grenade blast reverberated throughout the neighborhood. Local residents were concerned about the intense gunfire. According to authorities, the operation lasted approximately 15 minutes, but for the densely populated neighborhood in northern Quito, those minutes felt like an eternity. Later, residents noted that, in their opinion, the police made obvious mistakes during Juan's arrest. Errors during the operation had a significant impact and led to the death of Juan's adoptive mother. 
Consequently, an internal investigation by the Ecuadorian Attorney General's office was initiated. This investigation revealed several violations that contributed to the negative outcome of the operation. Among these violations were the excessive number of police officers involved and the lack of coordination in their actions. The Ecuadorian prosecution found evidence that the police officers initially intended to kill Juan on the spot, in other words, it was an extrajudicial execution. As a result of this investigation, four police officers involved in the death of Juan's adoptive mother were arrested, while other officers faced different disciplinary measures. Shortly after his arrest, Juan was taken to the Garcia Moreno prison. During his first interrogation, Juan assured the police that he had never intended to kill his victims. According to him, he would ask the victims to behave quietly and listen to him, but they repeatedly disobeyed and screamed. In his testimonies, he claimed that he acted on the orders of a retired military general named Joffrey Lima. Juan stated that Lima hired him out of a desire for revenge, as the taxi drivers were supposedly responsible for the rape and death of Lima's daughter. In another version of his statements, Juan claimed that he killed the taxi drivers based on his own reasoning. During the investigation, it was established that the gun used by Juan to kill his victims belonged to one of the Ecuadorian police stations. It was also determined who armed Juan and other members of his gang. These individuals were police officers Wilson Rosero, Vincanu, and Rafael Uchezalu. The judicial process against Juan progressed swiftly, and after he pleaded guilty to the murders, the judge sentenced him to the maximum punishment allowed under Ecuadorian law. At that time, the maximum sentence for minors was only four years of imprisonment. Juan was sent to the Rehabilitation Center for Juvenile Offenders named Virgilio Guerrero, a state institution dedicated to rehabilitating teenagers with legal problems. Several months after being incarcerated, Juan became the leader of the local minors in the rehabilitation center. Every day, he explored the possibility of escaping from the facility. He made an unsuccessful attempt once, but then he contacted his girlfriend and asked for her assistance. Juan requested that she bring him a firearm during one of their meetings. Over a year passed before Juan's girlfriend was finally able to provide him with a gun. On June 17, 1993, Juan and other young individuals who followed him made another escape attempt, which proved successful. One of the police officers working at the rehabilitation center tried to stop the escapees but was shot and killed by Juan. Consequently, Juan managed to flee to Colombia and settled in its capital, Bogota. Juan continued to sustain himself through criminal activities in Bogota. Living the same lifestyle in Bogota was not easy, and the police soon caught up with him. According to official sources, Juan surrendered to the authorities himself as he had nowhere to live, and he grew tired of hiding. He was deported back to Ecuador and returned to the rehabilitation center. One of the contradictory aspects of the case was that Juan was not facing new charges for the murder of the police officer during his escape. It turned out that Ecuadorian law did not allow for new criminal cases to be filed under the charge of murder because he was already serving the maximum sentence for that offense. In January 1996, after spending four years at the rehabilitation center, Juan was released. He was 19 years old at the time. The young man left the capital of Ecuador and went to Loho to live with his adoptive father. After Juan's release, the public questioned how someone accused of so many murders and escape attempts could be set free. During his confinement, Juan did not receive any treatment as he was kept in isolation. He was not provided with a psychologist, which means he was not professionally integrated into society. The presence of a person who had committed 22 murders did not remain a secret to the city's residents. He did not lead a hidden life and regularly went on outings with his father, visited nightclubs and brothels. In the last week of February 1996, just before Juan's 20th birthday, his body was discovered by a group of peasants on the banks of the Aguarico River. When the police arrived at the scene, they found the body of the young man dressed in a black shirt, light-colored pants, black socks, and white-blue sneakers. Juan had a bullet hole on his face and multiple cuts on his body, as well as bullet holes from a higher-caliber weapon. His hands were bound with galvanized wire. Inside one of his trouser pockets, a brown wallet was found. The wallet contained his identification card, a distance learning student ID, and a release certificate. According to official sources, all the evidence and clues found on Juan's body, such as the bound hands, machete cuts, gunshots, and beatings, indicated that the motive behind the murder was personal revenge. 
Just a month after his release, having served only four years, Juan, responsible for the cold-blooded murder of 22 people, met a gruesome death and was brutally tortured on the eve of his 20th birthday. It was terrifying. Thank you for watching, subscribe to the channel, Zargo, and leave a comment suggesting a topic for the next video.